A very good afternoon to all of you watching today and uh, to you who are watching this as a recording. I greet you also. You see, no prejudice. <laughs> People, we are looking today at this brilliant, brilliant poem called To Learn How to Speak. For some reason, I have a particular fondness for this poem. It speaks to me. It talks about all the elements of South African culture and language and everything and the way that they blend together. And really, I appreciate poetry like this. My only complaint, of course, that is that it doesn't have um, rhyme and meter. If it had had rhyme and meter, uh, it would have taken it, for me, out of the realm of very good into the realm of masterpiece. Because the content of the poem is really exceptional. Okay, now, dealing with this, remember that this poem is all about the unique diction used in South Africa. Diction is word choice. And this is what enriches this poem. He's not shy, Jeremy Cronin is not shy to chuck in all sorts of township slang and um, colloquialisms and stuff like that, and it works. It really works. Now, there are a couple of other poems to which I have access that I'm going to run through first before we look at Cronin's beautiful piece of penmanship. And we're going to see other examples of chucking in things about Africa as metaphors. Let's take a look at this first one here. Now, from the title, you will already see that I was having fun when I wrote it. <laughs> it's simply for fun, although I'm going to boast now. How many other people watching can ever claim to have written a sonnet for their wives? <laughs> well, I can, so there. Let me read it to you. This is for Michelle, and it's entitled A Romantic Free State Sonnet. More beauteous than a bucky, four by four, its tires and flanks with mud bespattered, and cattle licks in tubs oft scattered, art thou my free state love whom I adore. The feeling of thy person, muse of mine, is like unto the nestling rugby ball that didst perchance into mine arms firm fall ere I was but two paces from the line. Thy wondrous kisses sweeter art by far than fragrant smoke arising from a braai, or glorious tastes enjoyed each night ere I quaffed castle and then clip drift at the bar. Thus, Michelle, art thou to me, tire tough, bri mistress, huntress, wife, and free state rough. <laughs> There we go. And yes, it's simply for fun. You'll notice the diction in this one. Um, it's deliberately a combination of commonly used terms, uh, free state terms in particular, you know, words like bry and bucky and castle and clip drift and um, what are the other ones? Rugby, of course, all of we free states, we free staters, we are crazy about rugby as well, so I had to slip that in. And we are crazy about brying the whole lot of us, etc., etc., etc. And of course, four by fours, all part of the lexicon. Um, and this is my version of what Cronin has done. Let's take a look at a second example, also, funnily enough, involving a sonnet. Um, this one's quite advanced, so bear with me while we read through it. This is entitled, Look at Me, I'm a Poet. And I'll read it to you. Look at me, I'm a poet, a good poet. I know I'm a good poet because I've been published, so it's not only me that thinks I'm a good poet, because only good poets get published in English, because good poets are appreciated a lot, 
because good poets write good poems and our poems are in free verse, which is nice and I like free verse because it's nice and good and good poets like me can write and we can be published and appreciated when we write about people and heroes and clouds and mountains and very hot sun and valleys and animals like cheetahs and oppression and liberation and other things like that. Because it's nice and good published poetry, so I'm a good poet. Okay, it's not finished yet. The bard turned over in his grave and cursed. The emperor's clothes doth none save I perceive. And shall we poets excrement receive instead of lyrics well composed and versed? Where beeth the rhyme in poems required? And where the punctuation wanting here? Why doth no one to meter yet adhere? And why hath spelling now expired? These tawdry scribblings art but gouts of bile that dripped into the poet's rejection pot and art together but a noisome blot on lyrics. Vacuous they art and vile. Vexatious doggerel doth none enjoy save witless morons in the king's employ. Okay. <laughs> Enough said about that. The whole thing is... Um, I get very annoyed with people pretending to be poets, and they aren't. However, having said that, let's take a look at this work from Jeremy Cronin. While we're reading poems, let's get down to business. Now, I am very well aware that many of you teachers out there, and I know there's going to be some teachers watching today, or maybe on the recording, I know there are teachers out there who dodge this poem because it is actually quite tricky. It's got fairly advanced um, items of interpretation here, and it's um, a poem that, uh, shall we say, confuses many people. <coughs> Excuse me. Which is why we've specifically selected this poem for today. Now, as always, when you encounter a poem, um, for some of you it will be the first time, for some of you you will maybe have tackled it before, but always start by reading the poem, or preferably by having the poem read to you, because poetry is all about sound. It must be, I'm going to use an, uh, an advanced technical word here, euphonious. If it doesn't sound good in your ears, it's not a good poem. Now this one, as I said, um, I am disappointed that it doesn't have rhyme and meter. But having said that, it works brilliantly the way it is. Right? So, just listen as we read this aloud now. This is To Learn How to Speak, and it's by Jeremy Cronin. To learn how to speak with the voices of the land, to parse the speech in its rivers, to catch in the inarticulate grunt, stammer, call, cry, babble, tongues not, from which all words are cut. To trace with the tongue wagon trails, saying the suffix of their aches, in coil, pun, fontaine, in watery names that confirm the dryness of their ways. To visit the places of occlusion, or the lick in a flay bank dawn. To bury my mouth in the pit of your arm, in that planetarium, pectoral beginning to the nub of time. Down there, close to the water table, to feel the full moon as it drums at the back of my throat, its cow-skinned vowel. To write a poem with words like, I'm telling you. Stompy, stick fast, 
Golovan, Songololo, just boom bang. Just to understand the least inflections, to voice without swallowing syllables born in tin shacks, or catch the 515 Equata Bust 5, Schweinesburg train, to teach the low chant of the mine gang's mineral glow of our people's unbreakable resolve, to learn how to speak with the voices of this land. Come on now, doesn't that make such a brilliant impression on you? Yes, there's tricky bits. I mean, just for example, he's finished off the poem. The way he starts it, or similar, it's similar to the way he starts it. There are little differences there. Um, but he's finished it off by using a, um, a sentence which doesn't contain a finite verb. It's got um, infinitives only to learn how to speak with the voices of the land. So it's not a full sentence, but it carries this clear, unbreakable meaning. We understand fully what is being said there. However, um, we've read through three poems now. Now, um, it's unwise of us to stick to one topic for too long. So we're going to take a break just for a minute, maybe two minutes, to give you all a chance to have a glass of water or go to the toilet or whatever it is you do during those breaks. Just a, a reminder here, we are here, we've just finished the first part of uh, the poem for first additional language grade 12 uh, to learn how to speak by Jeremy Cronin. We'll meet you again in a minute. Goodbye for now. Welcome back. Here we go. Part two to learn how to speak by Jeremy Cronin. This is of course for English first additional language grade 12 and as you may have gathered from the first part is a poem that I enjoy very much. Now we've read through it, it's time to go down to the analysis of it. And this is where things get a little bit confused because of the relatively advanced diction being used here and the fact that that diction in question includes a lot of words that technically are not part of English. So quite a few explanations are required. And let's take a look at what we've got. As easy as that. Now, you'll notice here the beginning. To learn how to speak with the voices of the land. Right? It's personification. Because obviously uh, a country doesn't have a physical voice. But the voice is very much there. But um, that is to me, almost like a, um, a prayer, as if he's asking, can he please get this ability? Because it means so much to him. Okay. Right now, we get this very tricky line, to parse the speech in its rivers. Now, to parse means um, divide grammatically. There you can see it's on the screen. I don't know why I'm reading you this. And um, <laughs> please note, the only th comments I'm going to make there, the speech in its rivers. So when rivers speech is written down, please note the plural apostrophe to show possession, <laughs> that the rivers speak to us. And you know, what? this is another thing that I love about this poem. Rivers do have a voice. Every river has a slightly different sound to it. You know, if you go down to uh, Port St. John's, you've got the, um, the estuaries there of the Izimvubu, and I can't remember the other river. But now an estuary is a part of a river that at low tide, the sea comes into it. And at high tide, of course, um, the... Sorry, high tide the sea comes into it, and at low tide the river flows out. So it's both fresh water and salt water. And it makes such an incredible sound as that as the estuaries as the river level rises in the estuary, and it's it's just so different. I mean, we're accustomed here inland, we're accustomed to other types of rivers 
you know, we've got the orange, and um, which is uh, in Sesotho, that's the Senko. And of course, it starts off in Lesotho. That's how, why it has that name. And we have the um, Caledon, Caledon River, uh, which in Sesotho is the Mohokari. But all of these rivers have a habit of flowing either very fast or not at all. They are strictly linked to rainfall. And when we had some beautiful rain about a month back, all the rivers were flowing and you've got this continual roaring, thundering sound as they come down over the stones. And ah, oh, it's lovely. And that <laughs> speaks to me. Uh, it's, they have voices. They speak. I identify 100% which is what, with what is being said here. And, of course, I do actually divide up the voices of the rivers according to their flow. I mean, some of them um, flow. If you go down to the Western Cape, you've got things like the Breerafir and that sort of thing where they f it flows over rocks, but not with aggression. It's a continual flow. And you've got this, this continual gurgling sound. Rivers have their own voices. Lovely. Now, we come to something um, slightly more difficult, to be quite honest, to catch in the inarticulate grunt. Now, what is inarticulate? Basically means unclear. Um, it's a very common problem for teachers in the classroom. When the guy gets up, he's not too sure uh, he's answering a question, and he's not too sure if his answer is correct or not. So he turns to That is inarticulate. It's not clear. And, of course, a grunt is just that. <clears throat> um, <laughs> so here it's talking about understanding what is not clear or easy to hear, more importantly. It's not easy to hear. Okay. Um, stammer. Stammer is, of course, stuttering. Um, some people, uh, especially when they become emotional, they start to stammer or stutter. That's when they struggle to, to get, get words out. And like, it's, 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 it's difficult. For them. That is a very real psychological problem. And it's common as well. So referring to stammering, it means people who stutter. And then um, now we've had the grunt and the stammer. Now we get to the call. And oh boy, don't I just love when going into Lesotho and listening to the old and daddies talking to each other across the mountain valleys and with the echo of the voices and stuff. It's Glorious, glorious, glorious. And then, of course, the cry. A cry um, normally uh, indicates something negative, uh, but not always. It's just a maybe a loud shout, maybe a cry of distress. I don't know. There are many um, connotations to that. So I can't tell you exactly the meaning of that word, but all I can say is that it's got many meanings. And, of course, a babble. Now, the word babble, um, I think, is originally from Hebrew. This is why we have the Tower of Babel, uh, where, according to the accounts written in the Bible, it's where uh, God confused the languages of the people so that um, they were no longer able to unite and to build a tower so they could become like gods themselves. Um, origin of Babel. We have similar words used today. Um, for example, um, in the, the Bible also, I'm going to quote the King James Version, it talks about the um, barbarians. Now, where do we get the words barbarian? Does that mean an uncivilized person? No, it doesn't. It means a person who can't speak Greek or who couldn't speak Greek in those days. Because as far as the Greeks were concerned, um, all they were hearing when, when, a foreign, when they heard a foreign language, all they were hearing was barra, 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 barra. And they used to make fun of that. And the term barbarian originated there in the same way as um, in Sasutu. 
um, the term maquera quera. Um, it's based. It's an onomatopoeic sound. It's based on the fact that to a Masutu, um, it is meaningless. It's just quera 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 sounds that they can't understand. All of these words have evolved perfectly naturally and through the use of onomatopoeia. So technically, we have an example of onomatopoeia there. Anyway, tongues not. A knotted tongue simply means that you get tongue twisted. This happens to me quite a lot. When, you know, I've got a very bad habit of using these long, complex sentences with two or three subordinate clauses and a second main clause further along the line. And then sometimes I get stuck halfway through the sentence and I've forgotten what my original meaning was. That is called being tongue twisted. Or you get your tongue in a knot. And here we have the tongue's knot. <laughs> Brilliantly done, as always. And a sense of the stoneness of these stones. Isn't the imagery brilliant? Stoneness. He's, that is just, by the way, that is neologism. When a new word is created. I have never seen the, this word except in this poem. Stoneness, which sums up, you know, the very essence of being a stone. <laughs> Yes, I know that that doesn't sound very interesting. But again, you go up into the high mountains and you've got massive, massive stones. Actually, not so much in the high mountains, but normally um, uh, lying around at the base of the mountains. Massive stones that have broken away and come tumbling down millions of years ago. And you look at these stones and you, I think anyway, Boy, the stories that you've got to tell. And some of the stones are sandy and rough. Other ones are, you know, volcanic. And they are polished absolutely smooth. And we're talking about stones that are, uh, you know, easily the size of the Fidel Castro building and bigger. So it puts us, our human endeavors to shame. And we look at that and we think, wow, the history that is hidden within them. Okay, uh, here it's, it points out the difficulty of the origin of the language, hard. Okay, stones, of course, tend to be hard. So he's referring also to difficulty and hardness. Actually, the sandstone in, in Lesotho is disappointingly soft. Um, it's only about hardness five, whereas uh, if you go down to uh, Cape Town and you look at the Table Mountain sandstone, that's hardness seven, because that's quartzite. <laughs> it's a very tough rock. Okay, and from which all words are cut. Now, there we have, we're going back to origin and the development of languages. Um, you know, each language has its unique history. Here, when he's talking about the languages, plural, of Africa, um, we can't focus on a a specific language and say this is the language to which he's referring because we have at the moment um, I think it's now 12 official languages I don't know if sign language has yet been included as an official language I think it has been okay um, I know that um, there were big discussions about it last year and I followed those discussions but either way we have a rich 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 variety of languages, including some languages which are not really spoken anymore, but they are still there, very much so. You know, the Khoi language, the San language, um, those ones. So every one of those languages developed, evolved from the fact that the people were living in a specific place. The, For example, Susutu is a a musical language. Unlike English, it doesn't have consonantal clusters. I talked a minute ago about the old and daddies being able to talk to each other by calling clean across a valley. 
Their voice on a cold winter's morning carries easily for three, well, for a kilometer. Clear, clear, clear. That is because the language of Susutu has evolved to permit this. Susutu doesn't have, well, if we talk about things like school desks, you hear that? Those are consonantal clusters. And that immediately uh, prevents English being used in the same way as Susutu as a method of calling, just using a voice over a great distance. Also, there's other elements in each language. Obviously, um, uh, you will be aware of your environment. For example, the Eskimos have, I don't know how many words for snow. We only have one. And then if we want to change the meaning of it, um, well, we've got, we've got, I think, what, two? Because sleet is also a way of talking about snow that has melted before it's hit the ground. But otherwise, as far as we're concerned, snow is snow. To the Eskimos, it's very important whether it's fresh snow or old snow or wet snow or very dry, powdery snow or etc., 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 compacted snow. Um, they, their language has evolved according to their environment in the same way our language, our languages of South Africa have evolved according to the, the, where we are living. And just for the record, most of the um, area, the surface area of South Africa, tends to be dry. We live in a water-poor country. Okay, the East Coast, you know, Durban and the, um, the Midlands and stuff, sure, they get quite a lot of rain, and sometimes in the Free State, the rain comes down like crazy. But on the whole, I know, for example, um, the average rainfall of um, the area where my hometown, which is von Staden's Rist, the average rainfall there is 400 millimeters every year. Now, that's strictly average. Just for example, back in 1988, when we had the floods, uh, we got something like 2,400 millimeters um, in, I think it was 24 hours. It came roaring down. And occasionally, places like Langsburg, they get their floods there. But generally, we're dry. Okay? And here, we are now referring to the fact that South Africa is a dry country on the whole. The Karoo, the Kalahari, I mean, the Karoo uh, means what? It's, it's a sand word, um, which means basically dry place. And Khalakhari means place of thirst. Kalahari, Khalakhari, place of thirst. So even in those languages, it's exactly the same. They have caused the language to evolve the way it has. Right? And to trace with the tongue wagon trails. Isn't that a glorious image? To follow you, <laughs> use your tongue as a pointer on a map. <laughs> Tongue, of course, referring to water, the quest for water. Okay. And saying the suffix of their aches in. Okay, a, um, a kail, for example, is what we would call a, um, a pond or a, a depression full of water. A pan is a pan, which is a, a seasonal um, it's a place which has water seasonally. When there's rain, the pun will become full of water, and when it's dry, it dries up. Because fontaine, a lot of people confuse that. It's not translated as fountain. It's translated as spring. It's a spring of water. And very common names among the farms, uh, you know, um, Bitterfontein, that's a town on the... West Coast, and uh, what are the others? Uh, Springfontein, <laughs> Spring of Springs, I like that one. And um, Brackfontein is another nice one. There's many different types. You know, Sootfontein, which would imply good water. Ironically, in uh, very close to where I stay, uh, there's one called Sweet Water. It's actually named in English. 
But if you had to translate that, uh, it would come out as Sutwater or Sutfontein. And because they are so, uh, you know, the, the original trekkers, they were so focused on making sure of a water supply, water mattered. And here it talks about in the watery names that, um, that confirm, and we'll look at that in a second, but now we've got here the opposite of what's actually going on. The reason why you have watery names is because everything was so dry. And then it says that uh, in watery names that confirm the dryness of their ways. And isn't that a beautiful double entendre? In other words, two meanings. Ambiguity there. Um, here it talks about also their rigid traditional beliefs. I mean, according to legends, you know, the Trek Boer wagon, it always had a coffin because it was a useful thing for storing things in and equally useful when you needed to bury someone. And always the family Bible, the, the family Bible that was always part of the wagon. Of course, that is a tradition. Um, whether, we, whether that was true or not, we don't know. Uh, but we've got some pretty good historical accounts which tend to indicate that that is the way things were. Okay. Occlusion. Here we come to the word occlusion. To visit the places of occlusion or the lick. Okay. So we're going to stop and just look at this. Occlusion is a blockage. Right. So blocking in the stream and of course in the throat. Um, it can also be that that is being indicated here. Again, a clever double meaning. Okay, or the lick in a flay bank dawn. <laughs> and again, more than one meaning here. Um, uh, you know, in that first poem that we read, you know, the Romantic Free State sonnet, it talks about cattle licks in tubs, which is the way that they are normally scattered around the farms. It's a compressed a tub full of molasses and salt together and very tasty for cows they love these things they lick them all the time it gives them extra protein it gives them extra salt it's good or lick of your tongue uh, you know as if you're bending down to the water to take a drink brilliant imagery i'm going to stop at that point for a while we're going to take a break um, i know that this is pretty heavy stuff so I don't want anybody to stress themselves. Once again, time to take a drink of water or whatever it is that you drink when you stop studying or quickly use the toilet so you can get back for the next part. Just a reminder, this is the second part of um, the study on um, to learn how to speak. Uh, by Jeremy Cronin, which is for first additional language, um, grade 12. When we come back, we'll finish off this section. See you shortly. Welcome back. This is the third in the series uh, where we are studying this poem, To Learn How to Speak, by Jeremy Cronin. We, um, on the screen, you will see the point to which we reached the last time, and we shall simply continue from there. Okay, and the line is, reads as follows, to bury my mouth in the pit of your arm. Now, normally, <laughs> we don't bury our mouths in other people's armpits. <laughs> this is an interesting example of dysphemism. You know, we have uh, in English euphemisms. Just for uh, an example of that would be go to a, um, a cemetery, any cemetery you want, where there are graves. You will see that not a single person in those graves ever died. They passed away or they um, uh, moved on to a better life or something like that. Those are That's euphemistic ways of saying it. But when you deliberately use awful ways of saying things, uh, it's called dysphemism as opposed to euphemism. 
And in my opinion, this is dysphemism. Talk about burying your mouth in somebody's armpit. And yet it works. Okay? It's searching deeply. Of course, a pit is a hole. So um, it's a most unusual way of saying something. But this is a most unusual poem. In that planetarium, you know, here in Bloom, we've got a planetarium which is world class. It's on top of Naval Hill, and I must confess, I've never been there, and I've always wanted to go there, but I've just never made the time. So it's on my bucket list, because I also, um, you know, I, uh, when I studied at university, as you may have gathered by now, um, English was not my only major subject. I also majored in uh, geography and history and all that sort of thing. So um, to me, the study of the, scar, the stars, looking upwards to the sky and the planets, it was all part of the course. We had brilliant lecturers who took us onto the roofs with the, uh, the telescopes. And we looked. I mean, I have seen Saturn with my own eyes and the rings around it and stuff like that. It's fascinating. So another reason why I can identify 100% with this poem. You know, the planetarium, the symbol of what's above us. Okay, pectoral. Your pectoral muscles are your chest ones. Okay, so um, when you are getting here, it is the very center of your being. That's where your heart is. Your pectoral beginning to the nub. The nub that puts it on the... Ooh, I've made a typographical error there. Uh, nub equates with the, the core. You know, we have this English um, expression, get to the nub of the matter. Stop beating around the bush. There, I've just mixed two metaphors, uh, which is very naughty of me, but I like mixing metaphors. Okay, so... Getting to the very starting point. Water table. Most South Africans are familiar with the water table. It's the level to which you have to put down a borehole before you encounter the underground water. The water in the porous rock layers. Okay. And then to feel... The full moon as it drums. Isn't that just wonderful? And I have heard genuine drums under a full moon in the suit. It's quite thrilling. And here, as it drums, where? At the back of my throat? Okay, so those are your deeper bass sounds. Um, that come from, you know, inside the chest almost. And then it talks about its cow-skinned vowel. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. The, the sounds of the moon in the person's throat are being compared to a traditional African drum covered over with... Cow skin, it says here. Uh, we call it um, cow leather, but um, it's cured in a different way because uh, normally the drums they haven't taken the the fur, the outer layer of fur off, so it's still, you know, the colour of a a cow. Okay, and here we get to my all-time favourite bit of a poem that is one of my favourites: to write a poem with words like. Here we go. I would have used, of course, in formal English, we wouldn't speak like that. We'd say, to write a poem with words such as. But Cronin has written this down in the way that most people in South Africa, in fact, say it. He's done that on purpose. And take a look at that. I'm telling you, you know, when you're trying to persuade somebody to believe you, Something like, um, genuinely, I'm, say, I'm saying this sincerely, I'm telling you. Stompy, you know, classic name. Um, stick fast. 
<laughs> firm. <laughs> Goluven, I think that refers to some sort of drink, judging by the, um, the sound of it. Okay. Songololo, we all know the, um, uh, um, the English word for that is a millipede, a very, very common so that, um, animal in South Africa, a primitive life form going back 530 million years. Okay, just boom bang, um, thinking that that's great. Or just to understand the least inflections. Inflections, the rise and fall of voice. Um, one of the next presentations that I'm doing, by the way, um, is called Critical Language Awareness. And, and a vital part of that is inflection. But I haven't got time to go into that too deeply here. Let's just go back to where we were before. But take a look at this. Stompy. Okay. Uh, it's got either cigarette or short person. And then uh, that's just boom bang. We looked at that already. Okay. We've covered this. Let's go on. Just to understand the least inflections. Um, can I give you a um, simple example of inflection? Okay, the one, the one example that I've given in the, pre, in the, the soon and coming presentation is um, it's still raining. Can you hear that? A simple flat statement. It's still raining. All right? Nothing fancy about that. But now I can convert that into a question by changing my voice. It's still raining. Now it's no longer a statement. It's a question. And the words are exactly the same. Or you can say something, it's still raining. You know, in other words, why hasn't the, the, um, uh, the climate changed? Hmm. Or you can say, it's still raining. Now the stress is on the still. In other words, why hasn't the rain stopped yet? <coughs> That's just examples of inflection. Okay, alter the tone of your voice and you can alter meaning like crazy. To voice without swallowing syllables born in tin shacks. <laughs> Immediately I think of the poem Alexandra. <laughs> you know, that's another poem which just speaks of the, um, um, the classic the most famous township of them all, Alexandra and the Tinshaks and stuff. And we've got them also in von Staden's Rissets, sprawling area of shacks. Actually, many of them have uh, uh, been replaced by formal houses. But I'm very familiar with the inside of shacks, <laughs> especially in Lesotho. Ah, magnificent. Or, catch, I love this, the 515, and then it's... Horribly <laughs> or beautifully, whichever way you want to look at it, um, mispronounced. Uh, instead of a quarter past five, it's a quarter past five. Isn't that brilliant? I love things like this. And then you've got <laughs> Johannesburg. You can tell it's Johannesburg as long as you say it out loud. Okay? To reach. Um, The low chant of the mine gangs. Uh, okay, uh, we'll run a second line here. Let me just get it onto the screen. Mineral glow of our people's unbreakable resolve. So much there. I mean, here, obviously, Cronin was, uh, is, I don't know, an activist. So this is something that was close to his heart. This, this um, continual... Don't worry, it's going to be better in the future. And that's something. Sorry, I just want to comment on this. Um, I love going out onto the streets and seeing people who are poor making a plan. They don't just sit back there and say, you know, there's nothing I can do. I'm just going to have to wait for a pension. No. I mean, simple stuff. They set up a stall. And they've got their fruits and stuff like that. And 
their trade for the day. It's an income. They are making money. You know, the people selling fruit at the traffic lights or various other things, caps and uh, license holders and flash drives and everything. This, uh, this is one of these spirits of South Africa that is so beautiful that you've got this resolve. People don't just give up in despair. They make a plan. Lovely Afrikaans expression, boer mark a plan. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you keep going. You try. You refuse to let yourself be defeated. And finally, he repeats almost the same uh, sentence or sentence fragment with which he started this poem. To learn how to speak with the voices of this land. And thus he ends the poem. Whereas in the beginning it was to learn how to speak with the voices of the land. And now he's focused on South Africa. People, that's that. We're going to stop at this point. I hope that you have benefited from this. Um, and I hope that you're going to remember this for a long time, this brilliant, brilliant poem. If this is what you're studying, regard yourself as privileged. That was the third and final section of this presentation today on Jeremy Cronin's poem, To Learn How to Speak. I hope that this is going to stay with you for a long time. Goodbye for now.